love now and Did you fall in love last time? I love her. Love was stronger than anything else. For the love. Love. And I love you more than anything. There's still love. Love. From the New York Times, I'm Anna Martin. This is Modern Love. And this is our last episode of the season. And we're going to start it with you. Hi. Hi. Hello. We asked you to tell us the most unusual place you'd ever been on a date. It was a first date. Things felt weird. Hmm. (laughs) And I got to say, you all delivered. The 72-hour bus ride across the United States. At a marina for a memorial service for someone I didn't know. At the top floor of the Watergate Hotel, out on this ledge, and we walked halfway around the building. We have so many more of your stories, and we'll get to them later in the episode. But first, today's essay is about a date in a really weird and frankly unromantic spot. And it's a date that lasts for 10 days. The essay is written by Dev Ajla and read by Kong Sim. Liz and I were on a cargo ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with the sun setting and a light wind. The scene resembled one of those retirement brochures in which a couple stares wistfully across the open sea and into their future. Except she and I barely knew each other. It was our tenth date. I had connected with Liz through work a few months before, and we had gone out on several dates that felt promising. Then she called to tell me she didn't feel ready. Her actual words were, my astrologer says it's not the right time. I'm not a big believer in the stars. So I hung up, turned to my friend and vented about that astrologer who definitely hadn't been out on any of our dates. How could the position of the stars on the day Liz was born derail my dating life today? The next morning, I settled into the familiar letdown of losing something that had barely begun, resigning myself to more of the casual dating that so often characterizes relationships in New York City. A few weeks later, Liz messaged me as I was returning home from a friend's wedding overseas. She had changed her mind. In a small Chinatown bar, I showed her a photo I had taken of a cargo ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Seeing the ship made me think about how we no longer know the size of the world because we don't feel the distance when we travel. What would it be like to experience how far North America is from Europe? To travel by sea, as my grandparents did when they came a century ago from India. Let's do it, she said. She'd had two glasses of wine. Let's take a cargo ship across the Atlantic together. It'll be our next date. We both laughed. The next morning, I woke up and texted to tell her I was still thinking about the cargo ship. When are you free, she replied. Any time in the next three months. I was mostly joking, but it was also kind of true. My work as a consultant for startups allowed me to set my own schedule. Her work gave her similar flexibility. A few hours later, she told me she had booked it. We would leave in two weeks. I gulped. Things weren't supposed to move that fast. We had never spent more than five consecutive hours together. We had never spent the night together. And now our next date would involve a 10-day trip with only a few other travelers and a crew on a cargo ship. Yet, I knew I had to say yes. Why not take a big leap? When I finally told my family, my parents tried unsuccessfully to meet her, and my brother sent me YouTube videos of dates gone bad on cruise ships. It all started to feel overwhelming and like a very bad idea. After we boarded the ship in Halifax, it was clear that our room hadn't been built with romance in mind. Two bolted down single beds lined a wall. Our small bathroom reeked of sewage and diesel. 
The ship was 15 stories tall and as long as three football fields. There were only 28 people on board, including the captain and 18 crew members. Liz and I started to unpack. She had brought new sheets, cashmere blankets, candles, and lamps. I had brought a small Persian rug, scrabble boards, cards, books, and a list of questions to ask on a date. Just in case. My side of the room felt like a dormitory, while hers felt like home. So her side is where we stayed. As we laid on the single bed, adjusting to each other, shipping containers were being stacked with hard thuds outside of our window. We fell into a rhythm as our journey began, reading, sleeping, and sharing stories with the other travelers. We befriended a Dutch couple who had been traveling the world for six years in their modified Toyota Land Cruiser. They called themselves Overlanders. The big excitement involved emergency drills, where we would rush through hundreds of meters of container-made ravines and water-sealed doors, up a five-story metal staircase on the ship's outer edge to the escape vessel at the stern. We spent our afternoons camped out next to the espresso machine. One night, the Filipino crew hosted karaoke after a traditional meal of synagogue and breaded fish. All the idleness meant that Liz and I had no choice but to get to know each other. Mundane interactions turned into deep dialogues about our pasts. Hearing the captain tell a story about sending money home to his daughter led Liz and me into a long conversation about our relationship to money and how it has evolved over time. Every day on the ship felt like a month of dating in New York. Over those 10 days, we spent more than 160 hours awake together, shared two dozen meals, and made out more than the average couple does in five months. By the third day, I told Liz I loved her. By the fifth, we were talking about the future. By the eighth, we were arguing. She said I didn't consider her needs. I was pressuring her to be social when she needed time alone. I wanted her to see things my way and wasn't listening. In turn, I thought she wasn't accepting the reality of where we were. We just stared at each other in our small room. There was nowhere to go. If we had been back in New York, I would have left and met my best friend at a neighborhood bar to complain about her. He would have supported me, and I would have felt entitled to move on, repeating the dating cycle I had been stuck in for more than a decade. On the ship, however, there was no one to talk to to tell me I was right or wrong. I walked to the outdoor deck underneath the bridge and sat on a metal box filled with life vests while she stayed in the room. For the whole afternoon... I just sat there, replaying our conversations. There were moments she had told me she needed space. I just hadn't heard. I had never allowed myself to move slowly enough to truly understand what was being said. I never recognized the gap between what I said, what I did, and most importantly, what I wanted. Hours later, as the sun set, I walked back through the windowless corridor, entered our room, and sat down next to her on the bed. I'm sorry, I said. I am too, she said. We fell asleep on our single bed. Two days later, we arrived in Liverpool, England. In ship time, it was... <laughs> almost our one-year anniversary. We checked ourselves into a four-star hotel, ordered room service, and watched a bad movie. I looked at Liz. I loved her laugh, her red sweatshirt. Everything was perfect. On the plane back to New York the next day, we opened a bottle of champagne. 
A few weeks later, we went to Liz's astrologer for our first relationship reading. You're a match, the astrologer said. My Aries, Liz's Aquarius, the rising sign and the sun and the moon were all on our side. And more recently, as the coronavirus brought our city and country to a terrifying standstill, the two of us quarantined in a small house across the street from where I grew up. It's okay. We didn't mind isolating ourselves. For us, it made all the difference. After the break, I get Liz's take on the whole ship situation. Plus, more of your stories about the strange places you've been on a date. Seriously, some of you have been to some weird spots. That's next. Dev and Liz, hello. Hello. Hi, Anna. So, Dev, you wrote this essay how many years ago? Two years ago. And what's, what's happened for the two of you since then? We got married in 2020. Two years ago. Wow. Two years ago. Congrats. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I actually want to start with you, Liz. In the weeks leading up to the ship journey, what was going through your mind? What were your emotions? I almost didn't go. Mm. And... I think the big question in my mind was, what if Dev and I actually don't like each other? Mm. You know, what if we actually don't have a connection? And then I'm stuck on the ship with this person who maybe we don't even really enjoy each other's company or Mm -hmm. we get upset at each other. And so that felt sort of wild. Mm. And uh, I called my best friend and I said, do you think I should call him and tell him that I'm canceling the trip? And she said, I think no matter what happens between you and Dev, you will always regret it if you don't find out what happens. Mm. The outcome doesn't matter. It's about making the decision to choose hope Mm. and romance right now. Had you chosen hope before in this way? I had, actually. I had been married before. Ah. So I got married when I was young. And so I was very jaded by the time, because it was like almost 10 years later when I was in this situation with Dev. And so this was kind of my first instance of choosing hope again. Right. And what were the two of you feeling as you walked onto the ship for the first time. Oh, man. It's so intimidating. Mm -hmm. You're so small, and it feels like you're just entering, like, the belly of something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You are, and there's no way to get off. There's no You don't even know who to talk to to get off. You don't even know where the door is to get off. You're Mm -hmm. just in. And they left us in the room, Mm -hmm. and then they're like, we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Please don't walk around. around." (laughs) And they do tell you when you come on, Just to clarify, there's no medical attention here. This is the crew, and there's no doctor on this boat. And so then we're sitting here thinking, okay, we really are on our own. And then right when we sat down, we brought a bunch of food with us, and Dev um, ate some nuts. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. I don't know what's triggering for him. Oh, no. (laughs) Wait, I would love to know what what comes next after the nuts. I I had these raw almonds. Right. And I put one in my mouth, and I've, I've, like, been allergic to other things in my life before. And, like, you know, you start getting, like, that tingly feeling. I know. Or I was like, oh, my God. Like, I, what am I going to do here? I just got to, like, pay attention to my body. And then after he was able to speak again, because I think his allergy subsided, we just tried to be really positive. And so I said, let's take turns naming things that we really like in the room. He was like, I like that there's a wall. <laughs> I like that there's a wall. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I like that there's a wall. What did you say? Do you remember the things that you said? Yeah, I think I said I like that we have a little window. Mm. And then he said that he liked that there was wood, like fake wood paneling on the wall. He found that very comforting. I love this, though. I mean, in in this moment where it really seems like it's all downhill from here, you're like, let's play a game where we focus on the good things. How did you feel when she proposed that game, Dev? I mean, I was down for anything she was saying. <laughs> I was like, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a big part of our relationship now, looking back in hindsight, 
we both always try to just be really happy with what is. Mm. Um, and in that moment, I was like, oh, yeah, I have a friend here. This yeah. is going to be good. Devin Lewis, thank you so much for this conversation. It was such a treat to talk to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I am inspired by Devin Liz. When I go on dates, I pick between like one of three bars. If I'm feeling really crazy, maybe we'll get some ice cream. But I feel like I'm going to have to rethink my entire strategy because you all sent in some stories about dates in weird spots that sounded like so much fun. Early in my relationship with my husband, he took me to a landfill. You saw old bicycles and boats and there were birds wheeling around and I don't remember it smelling too bad. It was a really cool place. We meet on a street corner in Chinatown and we are participating in a taxidermy tour and so everyone was given rubber gloves and we went through the trash bins outside all the fishmongers in Chinatown pulling out things we could sew together later. We actually ended up losing the entire group of people and it was just me and Amy playing around in the trash. We had so much fun doing it. We were laughing so hard. One of my friends said, you're going to marry her. And he was right. So after just having met this guy, random stranger in an airport, I meet up with him on the side of a road in the Adirondack Mountains for a winter hike up a high peak. A graveyard at two in the morning. It was after junior prom. And it was where I had my first kiss with my high school boyfriend. An unusual date I took her on was taking her to a night court in downtown Brooklyn, where we would sit and listen to different cases that gave us a chance to talk to one another. Our verdict on most of the cases were always the same, and uh, we've been married happily for 57 years. Thank God we hit her off at night court. And then... Maybe there are some spots that are a little too creative. When I heard this next call from Natasha Devon in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I was like, this is it. This is the winner. I mean, it's not a contest, but if it was, this is the winner. Ding, ding, ding. Most unusual date spot ever. And I sort of, I need you to hear Natasha's whole story. It starts off normal with an online connection. There was this guy who I was friends with on Facebook for a while, and then he kind of slid into my inbox and was like, I would love to take you out on a date. So we go to this really fancy Mexican restaurant and order queso. The vibe is really good. He's very handsome. I'm hot as shit. So things are going great. Then he gets a phone call. And so he looks at me, he goes, hey, that's my job. I work at a morgue and I'm the guy that goes to pick up dead bodies. But I'm really enjoying your company and I don't want the day to end. Do you mind (laughs) picking up this dead body with me? I said, yes. So we're driving for like an hour and a half and I look over and I'm like, Am I the corpse? Because <laughs> no one knows where I'm at. Like, <laughs> this is a long drive. And I didn't tell my homegirl. So if you're going to kill me, tell me now. And he's like, no, no, no. I promise. I promise. Like, we're going to get an actual dead body. So we drive the rest of the way. We go pick up this old dead lady who died in her sleep. And let me tell you about the dead people van thingy that we're driving. So you strap the body down to the passenger side. But it's on this thing called like a roller. And so it slides back and forth. So if you hit a brake, then it hits the back of the passenger side (laughs) seat. So we're just riding and talking and the little dead lady is like smacking me in my back. And then I turn around and I like speak to the dead lady because I didn't want to be rude. We finally get to wherever they like fix the bodies up at. And... We walk in, he cuts the light on, 
it's fucking six other little old dead white people. And I'm like, this is how you die. This is how you die in the scary movies. And this is how like all the black people in the audience is screaming at the black girl, get out. But I didn't get out. I went further in. The funny thing is, though, now he doesn't work in the morgue anymore. He's a barber, which is way less exciting and probably why we broke up. But the point is, dead bodies on a first date. No one can top that. Well, there you have it. Thanks to Natasha Devon and to our other date goers, Elizabeth Lee and Christopher Cartwright from Hanover, New Hampshire, Daisy Dow from Chicago, Illinois, Jean Galligan from Gainesville, Florida, Gareth Miles from Brooklyn, New York, Emily Russell from New York, and Martin Blumberg from Long Island. This is our final episode of the season. We're taking a tiny break and we'll be back with new episodes very soon. Modern Love is produced by Elisa Dudley, Julia Botero, Christina Josa, and Hans Bito. It's edited by Sarah Saracen. This episode was mixed by Dan Powell. The Modern Love theme music is by Dan Powell. Original music in this episode by Dan Powell and Marion Lozano. Digital production by Mahima Chablani and Nel Galogli. Special thanks to Anna Diamond at Autumn and to all of the people who sent us voicemails and emails and voice memos. We loved each and every one of your date stories. The Modern Love column is edited by Daniel Jones. Mia Lee is the editor of Modern Love Projects. I'm Anna Martin. Thanks for listening. <laughs>